For 16 years, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis has dedicated itself to the preservation of human life by joining and supporting medical science in its war against polio. In the spring of 1954, the National Foundation proudly and hopefully sponsored a nationwide test of a trial vaccine designed to prevent paralytic poliomyelitis caused by the three known types of polio virus. The vaccine was developed by Dr. Jonas E. Salk of the University of Pittsburgh. Working under a National Foundation grant and drawing upon the research and experience of countless other men and women of medicine. Because science now knows that in many ways the polio virus abides by the well-established laws of immunology, it is fervently hoped that this vaccine will give effective immunity to the last major epidemic disease still on the increase in the United States today. But until its effectiveness can be established by scientific evaluation of the tests, due to be announced early in 1955, mankind's only weapon against polio is still gamma globulin. During the 1954 summer epidemic season, it was used extensively in emergency areas. When given under proper conditions, GG provides proven, though temporary, immunity against paralysis. But despite the National Foundation's polio prevention programs, Despite all the efforts of scientists and doctors and the generous contributions of laymen, polio again in 1954 reaped a heavy and grim harvest of new victims. It added thousands more to the 67,000 patients of other years who in January 1954 were still totally or partially dependent upon the National Foundation for help in getting care. Many new patients, as well as hundreds of the older ones, are respiratory cases. Medical knowledge and adequate care have now made it possible for many more of these severely stricken polio patients to survive than in earlier years. But survival itself and eventual recovery are dependent upon early diagnosis and prompt treatment. When the staff of the general hospital gives the polio patient the advantages of early diagnosis and prompt treatment and follows through with the personnel and equipment needed for continuing care, the paralyzed patient has a greater chance for survival and recovery with less physical and emotional disability. Conferences of doctors provide nurses and therapists with planned programs for each individual patient. Mechanical respiratory aids temporarily do the work of the muscles required to breathe until those muscles can recover or until substitute muscles can be trained to replace them. Some seriously involved patients may always require some respiratory aid, but special care in respirator centers has succeeded either completely or partially in releasing nine out of ten patients from mechanical breathing aids. It is a significant step from an iron lung to a chest respirator to a rocking bed. For many, these first steps are made in general hospitals. Because patients do better when grouped with other respiratory patients, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis has assisted in the establishment of 13 respirator centers at key medical locations throughout the country. Here, the most serious, the problem cases, and those no longer seeming to respond to usual treatments, receive clinical evaluation by specialists and have new effective treatment programs prescribed for them. Many newly discovered techniques have already made it possible for so many children and adults to resume productive lives at home and in their communities. Early life-saving tracheotomies are performed on patients suffering from paralysis of the throat and other muscles needed for breathing and swallowing. Prevention of complications of the patient contracting other diseases is a primary concern of doctors, especially for respiratory patients. But equally important is the prevention of deformity resulting from paralysis and the subsequent imbalance of muscle groups. Patients suffering respiratory problems are taught to leave their respirator aids for minutes, hours, 
or even days. During these times, therapy is essential to avoid deformity and to increase muscle power. Along with medical care itself, rehabilitation of the whole person includes many other factors. Positive psychological attitudes are essential on the part of the patient, the family, and the community. The hospital psychologist, the psychiatrist, the medical social worker, and the teacher can play important roles here. A man may have to be re-educated to a new way of life. There must also be some humor, some recreational activity, some companionship. The National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, with March of Dimes money, eases financial strain. Volunteers are recruited to help make life more agreeable. In order to exert his energies for recovery, the polio patient must be helped to keep his faith in a happy future. Provisions for beginning rehabilitation must be made in even the smallest hospitals. Respirator patients who need respirator center care should be admitted to them without undue delay. But for a variety of reasons, economic or medical, it may not always be possible or desirable for all respiratory patients to leave their local hospitals for larger centers. But for both groups, those who will move on and those who will stay, as well as for those who will return to local hospitals, therapy is essential. Those returning from respirator centers may often receive either clinic or home therapy. Most hospitals should provide some rehabilitation services for polio patients, as well as for other non-polio medical and surgical patients who may also require such services. On leave from their respirator aids, patients must learn to use the muscle power left to them, must learn and be helped to realize that recovery of muscle power is possible in many cases. They must realize that other muscles can and must be trained early as replacements for those which cannot perform their normal functions any longer. Through simple therapeutic exercises, through their discipline, patients see a brighter future. They develop new strengths which will help them to lead normal or near normal lives. They learn balance, physical, mental, and philosophic. In hospitals other than major respirator centers, adequate personnel to work with polio patients is a problem. But even a little time devoted to aiding a patient can mean so much. And there are in many communities and can be in any hospital community, a core of polio emergency volunteers, townspeople eager to learn, to help hospital nurses in their tasks, willing to give their time and a loving hand. Equipment for respirator patients in hospitals is expensive and elaborate. But through the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, financed by the March of Dimes, this equipment is provided whenever needed for any polio patient. It's a long, long way from a respirator to a kitchen. But a woman's place may, after all, be in the kitchen. In her own dependence on braces and a wheelchair, a wife may still have a husband and children dependent on her. A polio patient must learn to bathe a new way before going home, and someone must show that new way. The lighting of a cigarette can become a major triumph following months of practice, hours of effort, agonizing minutes of struggle. But without help, there could be no beacon of success. Someone had to help early and consistently. If a man must earn his living or his families, he must learn a new trade more adapted to his restrictions or relearn his old craft, using his imagination to discover new means of performing it. A smile along the way is essential. And seeing how far another polio patient has come along the road to recovery is a great inspiration. Much that is simple and effective can be done in any hospital. It can mean so much in helping to keep a patient's faith in himself. Doctors, nurses, and others give their devotion, their skill, and the best go the extra mile. Respirator patients must not be left in their iron lungs. 
If there is any way they can be helped toward a return to their families, their professions. Little children like these must be understood by their families and communities and help to play and grow up as happy and useful citizens of this great land. They deserve our compassion and our support and our most tender and thorough care. Give generously to the March of Dimes. Send your dimes and dollars as much as you can to your local March of Dimes headquarters today. <laughs>